want to welcome all of you who are fellowshipping out in the hallways. Go ahead and make your way into this room or into the commons, our overflow room. I want to say good morning to all of you over in the commons. Thank you for serving by sitting in, in there. Don't forget to grab communion elements off the tables in the back on your way in. If you are visiting us today, we're excited to have you. We want to meet you. So Countryside family, if you see somebody new, make sure you greet them, welcome them. As we prepare to worship together this morning, if you would, go ahead and stand with me. I'm going to read from Psalm 145, verses 5 through 7. It says, On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and I shall sing of your righteousness. So this morning, let us sing together this awesome God, his awesome deeds, his perfect righteousness, and his abundant goodness. Let's sing together.
seated. And what a joy it is to be gathered here again with our church family to worship our great God. And please remember to grab a communion cup if you didn't from one of the tables in the back. And we invite you to drink the cup and eat the bread with us this morning if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. If you're not a follower of Christ, or you have unrepentant sin in your life, or if you're under church discipline from this church or another church, we do ask that you would refrain from partaking in communion with us. But please, watch and listen as we unpack the truth about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who can save your soul. So we're here again. You've pulled those dress shoes out of the closet, put the crock pot on low, loaded the kids in the minivan, or the passenger van. You know who you are. <laughs> it's another Sunday at church. It's another communion message. Another song to sing. And another sermon to hear. And so a question that we should ask ourselves, is this just another Sunday to you? Is this how you've always done things? Are you just physically here in this building? Did you bring a heart of worship with you today for the Lamb who is worthy? If we didn't come here with a heart yearning to worship our King, then that is sin. And there's likely something getting in the way of worshiping him in spirit and truth today. So I want us to consider the idols and the pursuits of our heart. And as we set aside everything in this moment for prayer and reflection, go before the Lord. Ask him to give you a heart of worship, desiring fervently to honor him today and to set aside the idols, the sins, and the struggles of our lives. Would you do that as we go to him in prayer this morning? Our time in communion is worship. This is a simple statement, but a deep truth. Communion reminds us that he is worthy. And without the death of God's son upon the cross, we are not. We can never have a right relationship and peace with God apart from the atoning work of his son, and it is because of Jesus that we worship him. And we worship him in communion, remembering his blood shed and his body broken that satisfied the wrath of the Father and made propitiation for us. Consider the magnificent Savior that we worship this morning from these words of Scripture. 1 Peter 1, 3-9 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, 
undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This, this is worship. This is a right heart of worship before our great Savior. These are the words of a man who knows that Christ has saved him. Considering this passage, we have to ask ourselves, is this the way that we worship? You're born again to a living hope, and the world doesn't have this hope. So worship him in communion today. Don't just go through the motions. If we didn't come here to worship the king this morning, then why are we here? Our trials and our pains on this earth pale in comparison to the pains of our Savior. Yet he bore our sin on the cross and was resurrected. So rejoice this morning with a joy that is inexpressible. Our, sa our salvation has been secured by the King of Kings. Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. You can go ahead and take the wrappers off of your cups. And I'd like to ask our deacon, Jonathan Slavin, if you'd pray for the bread before we eat. Oh Lord, you are the almighty creator and ruler of this universe, yet you humbled yourself and allowed yourself to be horrifically tortured and your body beaten beyond recognition. The fact that the creator allowed his creation, his creation that can't even survive in the presence of his glory to carry out such a horrific atrocity is on our behalf for us is incredibly humbling and leaves me speechless. Thank you for loving us that much. I love you more than anything. Amen. And Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. And I'd like to ask our deacon, Greg Allen, if you'd pray before we drink. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we're so thankful for your uh, unmeasurable grace you gave to us. Uh, I pray that we will remember and continue to give you all the praise and the glory, and that we give you uh, obedience as the one uh, holy and righteous God who deserves it. Amen. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. And you can stand as we continue worshiping. in 
Amen. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for this great morning, for providing this time for us to worship you, to fellowship, to hear the preaching of your word. And Lord, please help us now to live out what we just sang, that we would value you as supreme as your word is given to us. Help us to take our minds off of the things that are infiltrating our, our thoughts from the week and from today and help our minds to be fixed on you as supreme above all. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be um, excited this morning because we have a very unique opportunity as a church and we've got a lot of new faces in the past year. So I wanted to, to stand up here. I'm not preaching, uh, but I wanted to stand up here uh, just for a moment to introduce you to someone who's preaching this morning that you might have not met before or heard preach before if you're newer to our ministry. Uh, back in 1994, when Countryside was uh, very small, uh, God called someone within our body to um, go into ministry as a pastor. This was back in 93, and it was Pastor, what well, we call him Pastor now, but uh, Brian Warren. Brian and Danielle Warren um, are in Mexico, which is why you don't see them regularly, but uh, Brian in um, 1999, I believe, that's when they departed for Sinaloa, Mexico, to church plant among the Mayo Indians in um, a particular area of Sinaloa. And if you pay attention to anything that's in the news at all or anything that, that goes on related to the drug trade and things like that, Sinaloa is at the heart of all of it. And so um, Pastor Brian and, and Danielle are very active in their church community there and um, a church that is growing and thriving. Uh, they're in uh, a small, dusty town of Mochikawi. But Brian is also involved in training up leaders and future pastors among uh, young men from Mexico and Peru and other Latin American uh, countries. So he's very involved as a leader of leaders. And we're very blessed this morning to have Brian. You can come. We're very blessed to have him as they're back for a short time to, to have him come preach the word to us. So that's a little bit uh, of a snapshot. But if you've not met Pastor Brian, we encourage you uh, to meet him afterwards. But you probably want me to stop talking about you so you can talk about the text. Thank you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Buenos dias. Good morning. It's always a joy to be here. A joy to be back, and uh, I love to get to stand in this pulpit and just look out for a moment and see our growing countryside family. I like to see faces of those that we've known for so long, those that we're getting to know, and, and many of you that we have yet to meet. And I know that for some of you, you're back there in the overflow room, and I just wish they could put a camera back there and a screen up here so I could see your faces as well. But thank you for serving our body and using that so that more can come and hear the Word of God. Well, as Pastor Michael mentioned, uh, we're here for a brief time. I'm actually leaving Tuesday to uh, travel to Honduras for a week of ministry. If Hurricane Julia doesn't wreak havoc on the travel, so you can be praying for that. I got a little text this morning from the airline warning me that things may change. But uh, the Lord has, uh, uh, has plans for us there, so if you'd Pray for that, and uh, over these past few years, we have been involved not only in the local church pastoral ministry, uh, but it's been a joy to have men from Mexico and Honduras come and train with us and then be sent out to plant churches in two other states, in Mexico as well as in different locations in Peru. And so that's been a, a joy of ministry at this stage to be involved in equipping men for church planting, and then to shepherd their families and walk with them as they begin to see the reproduction of churches take place. And I know here at Countryside we're seeing the same. We have young men of God who are preparing to become missions-minded local church pastors and church planting missionary pastors. So I want to revisit a passage with you this morning that will help us as we consider each of our roles in the area of preparing men of God who are being called to pastor and plant churches. So 
with my desire to preach Christ this morning and His gospel, I want to help us consider the ministry of missions, and we'll be focusing on a passage of Scripture from the Apostle Paul's magnificent treatise on the gospel known as Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 1, beginning in the first verse. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to open your word and allow your spirit, the spirit of holiness, to minister the word that he inspired to us this morning. I ask that you would open our hearts and minds and remove distractions from us so that your spirit can encourage and exhort as you wish. Pray also for those that may be here that have yet to come to see Jesus as he truly is revealed from his word. So Lord, we just pray that you would work the miracle of salvation in their lives, that you would open blinded eyes to see Jesus as they uh, have spiritually deaf ears open to hear the word of God proclaimed. And Lord, I pray that you in a special way would help me, assist me as I Proclaim your word in this English language, which is not so common for me to preach in, that I wouldn't stumble over the words and, and cause any confusion for those that need to hear your word clearly proclaimed. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is the gospel. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that we find at the very heart of this ministry known as missions. Missions involves proclaiming the gospel in order that the Spirit of God might use the message to bring people from every tribe and every tongue into obedience for the purpose of exalting Jesus Christ our Lord. Missions is at the very core of a ministry that includes evangelism and discipleship, which seeks to see the reproduction of solid Christ-exalting local churches. We see this in the Great Commission of our Lord, given to us first to His disciples and then continued throughout the church age. Matthew 28, 18-20, verses very familiar to most of us. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. By the authority of Christ, we are to make disciples of Jesus. Through the proclamation of the gospel and the ongoing teaching of his word, those who were once spiritually dead in their trespasses and sin are granted spiritual life in Christ. And then they identify publicly with Christ as Christ's disciples through baptism and go on to learn and obey His will as it is taught from His Word. And since baptism is given as an ordinance of the local church, we understand that the great commission of our Lord involves the reproduction of Bible teaching, Christ-exalting, believer-edifying, and lost evangelizing, disciple-making local churches. We at Countryside have been have have chosen to devote ourselves to the mission of training up, sending out, and then supporting church planting pastors in order that local churches can be established in obedience to the commission of our Lord. God has called some of us from countryside to plant churches and then move on to establish other local churches. And God has called others to plant churches and then stay there in that location in order that they may become places where future church planting pastors will be equipped and then sent. This church was established by Pastor Mike's ministry as a missionary church planter, used of the Lord to establish in the establishment of countryside as a local church. This body right here where the Lord has equipped and is still equipping 
church planting missionary pastors for the reproduction ministry of the local church. So this morning, I'd like us to look at this text of Romans chapter 1, the first six verses, through the missionary lens of the Apostle Paul as a model missionary church planter. But my hope is that we will be encouraged and challenged together by our Lord concerning the role that each of us has been called to in carrying out our parts of obedience by faith to the Great Commission of Jesus. This is a message about Christ and His gospel. Because central to everything in the ministry of missions is Jesus Christ and His gospel. So as we look at the centrality of the gospel, the centrality of the gospel message, which is found at the heart of missions, here in verse 1, our text first speaks to us concerning the messenger in missions. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The messenger in missions. As we read through the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, and as we read his spirit-inspired letters to the churches, it is obvious that Paul is, in fact, a great example of what it is to be a missionary church planter. But even as we learn from his example and from his apostolic teaching, it is important to remember it is not Paul who is to be our ultimate example. Paul is not looking to make others into merely followers of Paul, but rather followers of Jesus Christ. In his first letter to the Corinthian church, Paul sharply rebuked, scolded those who who found their identity in being followers of Paul and not servants of our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.13, he says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And the answer is, of course, absolutely meant, absolutely not. And, and yet later, in, in chapter 11, Paul said to the Corinthians, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Only as followers of Christ are we called to follow his example. The issue is not merely be like Paul. We are to be like Jesus And that happens through the transformation of lives by the power of the gospel, which conforms us into the image of Christ. Understanding that, however, there are some great things we can learn from Paul's ministry as a follower of Jesus, written here in chapter 1, verse 1 of Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So there's three things that I want us to observe together in this verse as we consider or as we look at the messenger in missions. Paul starts out his letter briefly, pretty much giving us his standard greeting from Paul to the church, grace and peace to all of you. Now we see that in Romans like in other places, but to catch it we need to see uh, combine verse 1 with verse 7. Paul, to those All those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. But but here in this letter to the Romans, after stating his name, Paul goes on in verses 1 through 6 to describe himself and the ministry of the gospel to which he has been called. And it is in this almost parenthetical phrase-like description tucked away in the middle of his greeting that we'll be focusing our attention on this morning. What are the three descriptions that Paul uses of himself that help us understand the man who is called to be a messenger in missions? He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This messenger in missions is, first of all, submissive to the master. He is submissive to the master. He is a servant of Christ Jesus. The the term translated here as servant, sometimes translated as bond servant, could actually be translated as well as slave. We who were once prisoners, once enslaved to sin, have been set free from the bondage of sin to now serve a new master. We are now free in Christ, but not free to live our for ourselves, but rather free from our sinful desires of the flesh and transferred into the kingdom, from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. No longer enslaved to sin, Romans 6, 6. Set 
free from sin, Romans 6, 7. In Romans 6, 17, he says, But thanks be to God that you who were once enslaved of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Sin no longer reigns over us because we have a new master to submit to under the lordship of Christ Jesus. Romans 6, and 23 says, But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the messenger in missions is, first of all, submissive to the master. And secondly, is selected for a mission. Called to be an apostle. Now we, now we understand that, that Paul's specific case, he, he was called by the resurrected Lord personally on the road to Damascus, and that he was called to be an apostle. He was called to the apostolic office in, in the more specific sense of the word, referring to those 13 very specific men. That is, the 12 disciples, including Matthias, who was selected to replace Judas Iscariot, and the apostle Paul who described himself in 1 Corinthians 15, 8 as one untimely born in reference to his calling as an apostle. We, we understand that there are no longer men being called as apostles in that more specific and technical sense of the word as it is used here by Paul. He was a called apostle with all the apostolic authority granted to him by the Lord as an apostle, just like the other 12. We are no longer living in the apostolic era of the church age. There are no new apostles, although there are some who claim to be today. But in a more general sense, that term, it can be translated as a Apostle, it, it also carries with it the meaning of one who is sent. Someone who has been appointed and sent to carry a message to someone else. Someone who has been sent on a specific mission. And in that more general sense of the word, missionaries are those who are sent by Christ to carry his message. In this, in, this is the mission, to carry the message of Christ to those who need to hear. So, so the message in missions is one, the messenger, excuse me, the messenger in missions is one who has been selected for a mission. And as we consider the ministry of missions and those men that have been or will be called, selected to serve as messengers of Christ and the gospel in missions, we recognize the importance of sending men who have been called or selected by the Lord for the mission. It is the Lord who calls. When we speak of the Lord calling men into the gospel ministry, we recognize that there is both an internal, more subjective sense of divine calling, as well as an external confirmation of that divine calling. A confirmation of that calling by other mature believers who will recognize the Lord's hand upon his servant. And both are very necessary. So, so there's a passion for ministry that must first exist. That is the aspiring to be a pastor spoken of in 1 Timothy 3.1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. That sense of divine calling provides a necessary passion for proclamation and compassion for people. The Lord calls his servant, and he prepares those that he has called. You may have heard it said that if a man can be content doing anything else besides pastoral ministry, then he should. And that statement is not meant to discourage those who may be called into pastoral ministry, but rather it is to help confirm whether or not that inner desire is a real calling from God. When it comes to pastoral ministry of church planting, that is all the more true. 
If you add to that pastoral ministry the, the foreign language that may have to be learned, a different culture, a difficult lifestyle, and a great distance from family and a home church that you love, if one can sense a satisfaction in doing anything else, it may very well be that he should pursue that endeavor instead because ministry at times can become very difficult. Without an overwhelming sense of the Lord's calling, the temptation may come one day to just throw in the towel and start pursuing something else. I have met young men who sensed a love and a passion for the idea of missions, but not really a love and passion for the day-to-day, walk-by-faith, hard work of the ministry of missions. Maybe they heard a motivational message from Isaiah 6, 8. And and I heard a voice. uh, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I. Send me. And so they sensed a desire to be sent without realizing that just like in the actual case of Isaiah, spelled out in the next verses, sometimes the ministry will involve faithfulness, to proclaim God's message to a people who will refuse to hear and refuse to repent. And when times like that come, a confidence in the Lord that He has called may be the strongest encouragement to keep you faithful and diligent to press on in ministry. Knowing that because of that call, you could never really be satisfied doing anything else just may be what is needed during difficult days. The difficult days that will eventually come into the life of the messenger in missions. And and so, uh, it is that calling or selection by our Lord that first comes as an inward desire, but also contains an external element of confirmation. We do not send people who solely have a passion for the idea of missions, but rather men who are already serving and demonstrating in their present service the call of the Lord on their life. That call will be evidenced in the character of the man as well in his capacities for service. We are seeing that in the lives of young men here at Countryside. A character that is mature and that is continually maturing in Christ. And God-given capacities that are being perfected through diligent study and dedicated service. Merely crossing an international border will not make someone a missionary if they have not already begun serving as a submitted servant of the Master. Involved in the ministry of missions right where they live today. There are, in fact, men who make it to the mission field whose home churches would never put them on their own pastoral staff. Some have never been called. Many are unqualified because they do not meet the spiritual qualifications or possess the ministry capacities set forth in Scripture. But there are others who may be called, but they have never been granted the opportunity to be tested in ministry where they could receive the kind of training and experience needed before being sent. At Countryside, we have a wonderful privilege to be a place where men of God can have their calling tested and when found genuine, confirmed by others so that they can be sent forth with a mission. So Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Lastly, we see concerning the messenger in missions that he is to be one who is separated unto a message. Separated unto a message, set apart for the gospel of God. Set apart or separated unto speaks to the idea of being consecrated or chosen for a specific purpose. It speaks of the fact that he was appointed by God as a messenger of the gospel message. In Acts 13, 2, we read concerning the sending of Paul and Barnabas from, from the church in Antioch uh, of their first mission, on their first missionary journey. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. 
You know, even in Galatians 1.15, Paul speaks of having been set apart by God even from his mother's womb. Now, now being set apart from birth, although called by God, there was much that the Lord had to still do in his life before he would become the man of God that he needed to be in order to proclaim the message for which he had been separated unto by the Lord. So as these men are called, we need to invest in their lives and help them prepare so that they'll be ready for the task that is at hand when they're sent forth to proclaim the message. So in verse 1, we've seen the messenger in missions. He is one who is to be submissive. He is one who is submissive to the master, selected for a mission, and separated unto a message. Before we move on to the next point, I just want to uh, give you a brief challenge. The Lord has given us, as a body, a tremendous opportunity to be involved in the lives of men who are presently sensing a call to serve as the Lord's messenger in missions, in others who will serve as missions-minded pastors here at home. It is a real blessing granted to us by the Lord to have a handful of men sensing a call to pastoral ministry and some of those young men sensing a specific burden for church planting in places around the globe that need the message of the gospel. We have young ladies as well willing to accept the challenge to serve as helpful companions to those men who will one day serve in those capacities. So with that privilege also comes a great responsibility. A responsibility has been placed upon our shoulders to invest ourselves in the lives, in their lives and to be used to help them in their preparation for future ministry. All of us have a role in that process as they will need to be further matured in areas of their character and continually developed in their capacities for service. And God may be calling others from among us here as well. And he doesn't only call the young. We often talk about young men being called out for missionary service or pastoral ministry. But he doesn't only call the young. He doesn't only call those who grew up in Christian families. I already had a wife and two kids before I even started attending church. When I started sensing a call towards missions, I was told by the pastor in the church where I previously attended that God was a logical God. And that it just was not logical that he might call me to sell my house, quit a good job, move my family, look for a new job or jobs in order to dedicate all of the time and resources needed to study and prepare when there were so many young single guys fresh out of school that could more easily answer that call. Well, praise God that his ways are not our ways. And he often chooses to work in ways that defy human logic in order to glorify his name. If God calls, it will require great sacrifice, diligent preparation, and an ever-growing faith. But let me tell you something. God, our God, he is an ever-faithful God, and you can trust him. And when the cost of obedience seems very high, Just remember that the cost of disobedience is always higher. After the messenger in missions, the next thing I want us to see here as we look at this passage through the missionary lens of the Apostle Paul is the message of missions. We've seen the messenger in missions, now the message of missions. And we see this in the last part of verse 1 on through verse 4. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This is the message of missions. It is the good news about Jesus Christ, who he is, and what he has done. It is the message that Paul proclaimed in 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with with the scriptures. It is the good news about a righteous Savior who died to save unrighteous sinners in order that they might be made righteous in Him, having His righteousness imputed to their accounts. 
That's what Paul will proceed to explain through 16 chapters of this letter, unpacking the glorious truths and implications concerning the good news of the gospel. So what can we learn about the message of the gospel here in the text before us? There's much we can learn about the gospel here before us. I believe that many Christians lack enthusiasm about sharing the gospel because they really do not have a strong confidence in the power of the gospel. Paul understood the responsibility that we have as believers to proclaim the gospel. We as recipients of God's grace have an obligation to proclaim, to preach the gospel of grace to those who have yet to hear. And Paul held nothing back in proclaiming the gospel because he understood that the power of the gospel is in the message rather than the messenger. If we jump down and are reading to verse 14 of Romans chapter 1, we hear Paul unashamedly declare, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Where did Paul get such confidence? Paul dedicated himself to studying and understanding the depths and the riches of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. This is the message of missions. It is the gospel. The first thing we notice about the message of missions is its singularity is distinct. It is the gospel of God. The message of missions is not a gospel. It is not some good news. The message of missions is the good news of God. There is an exclusivity to the message of missions. Its singularity is distinct. We live in a day when, where, where the message of tolerance has so permeated society that it is becoming unacceptable to boldly declare that it is only through Jesus, the mediator between God and man, that someone can have a right relationship with their Creator. That He and He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, Jesus said in, in John 14, 6, we have His words, Jesus said to Him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other name under heaven by, but Jesus given among men by which we must be saved. There is but one message of missions. We preach Christ crucified and resurrected. We do not preach a psychologized gospel of self-esteem because man's problem is not that he is basically good, a basically good person that feels beat down by outside circumstances, but rather that man is basically rotten to the core, possessing a sin nature, and therefore needs a Savior who has solved the problem of sin. We do not preach a social justice gospel that merely seeks to help the poor and persecuted experience a more comfortable way of life on earth before spending an eternity in hell. No matter how much you spend to drill wells in the desert for underprivileged people, if no one stays there to show them Jesus from his word, they will not experience the everlasting forgiveness of of their sins, as did the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Jesus said to her, John 4, 13 and 14, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give, that I will give him, will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Not only does the message of missions have a singularity which is distinct, but its source is divine. Its source is divine. It is the gospel of God. When Paul speaks of the message being the gospel of God here in this text, he is not merely saying that it is the good news about God. While it is true that the gospel is the good news about God, the point Paul is making here in this message, in this text, is that the good news actually comes from God. To reject the message of the gospel is to reject God. 
The source of the message of missions is divine. The message does not originate with the one who is sent, but rather with the one who sends. And the message comes from a divine source because at its core, man's problem is spiritual. It is not political. It is not psychological. It is not physical. It is not economic. It is not emotional or educational. Man is spiritually dead, needing spiritual regeneration. He must be born from above. He needs the message whose source is divine. Next, we see concerning the message of missions that its story has been declared. The gospel of God, he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel, the story has been declared through the pages of the Bible. And it is securely promised. It is the gospel of God. And our text says that he, God himself, promised the message beforehand through his prophets. Because its source is divine and God himself has promised, we can most assuredly trust the message of the gospel to accomplish its purpose as it is proclaimed. This verse speaks not only of the security, but also of the antiquity and of the continuity of the gospel message. The message of missions is not a new message. <clears throat> the message of missions is the same old, old story. From the early pages of Genesis chapter 3, following the fall of man into sin, we have God's unfolding story of redemption. Genesis 3.15, I will put into in, in, enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or the seed and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. From the seed of the woman would come one day a savior. Not only do we see the antiquity of the gospel, but also its continuity where this same unfolding message of the gospel of God would continue from the old covenant or the old Testament into the new. There was not one gospel message for the Old Testament people and another for the people of the New Testament. I, I hear this sometimes from Christians who think that the Old Testament people of Israel were saved by works, but now in the New Testament, church age, we are saved by grace. As if God had some plan to save sinners by works, and oops, that plan failed, so now we'll move on to plan B. Anyone who has ever been saved from their sin has been saved by grace through faith in our Lord. The entire sacrificial system foreshadowed the ministry of the Messiah who was prophesied in the Old Testament and presented in the New Testament. And the only obedience that ever brought glory to God is obedience by faith. Its story has been declared. It is securely promised, and it is scripturally proclaimed. The gospel of God, he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. We preach Christ from the pages of the Bible. How will the lost and dying world know of their need for a Savior? How will the rebellious minds and hearts of our neighbors and friends become changed concerning Jesus? They must see Jesus as he truly is, as he is revealed to us through the pages of Scripture. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, says Romans 10.17. The Holy Spirit of God uses the word that he inspired to open spiritually blinded eyes to accurately see the irresistible Christ Jesus our Lord. We must remain committed to authoritatively proclaiming the Lord Jesus as he has been, is, and always will be unchangingly, unchangingly revealed by the spirit of holiness from the pages of this sacred book. It is the message of missions. The gospel of God he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The message of missions is the gospel the next thing we notice here about the message of missions is that its subject is beyond description. The gospel of God, he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. 
the gospel of God concerning his son. Its subject is beyond description. Will you let that think in, sink in for a moment? Concerning his son, central to the gospel message of missions is Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's all about Jesus. The gospel is not some plan, but a person. Jesus, the God-man, the divine creator God who took on human flesh of his creation in order that he might live a sinless life and die a sacrificial death in order to pay the penalty for the sin of those who would come to trust in him. We use words like amazing, magnificent, and glorious. But the truth is that he is far too wonderful to describe and too marvel, more marvelous than we can really fully grasp with our minds. The message of missions is the gospel whose source is God concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God, in power according to the Spirit of holiness, by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. 100% God and 100% man. Concerning His Sonship, Son of God and Son of David. Eternal Son of the living God who was born in the city of David. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Time won't allow us to unpack all of the glorious significance of these two great declarations concerning Jesus, the, the subject and the substance of the gospel. But, but let me say that, let me say that they both touch on, they, they touch on both his humanity and his deity as our Lord. First, his humanity. As to his earthly life and sonship, he is descended from David according to the flesh. He is, in fact, the promised Messiah that came according to the lineage of David. Luke 1.32, He will be great and He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give Him the throne of His father David. Our text next points to His deity. And was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. He was declared, or He was marked out to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead. Already was mentioned that this message of the gospel of God concerns His Son, the eternal Son of God. And here, without taking the time to completely unpack and explain the details, let me just say that this title, Son of God, here may speak more of a continuation of Christ's messianic role because of the way that the corresponding title has been used in the Hebrew Scriptures of the Old Testament. But having said that, just as Christ's coming as the son or the seed of David according to the flesh or pertaining to his earthly ministry spoke of his humanity, emphasizing the incarnation of the son, his being marked out as the son of God, even with that title referring again to his messianic position, the phrase in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, most definitely speaks to his deity, the deity of Christ, as one whose name is highly exalted above all names by the Father. Philippians 2, 5-11, speaking of the incarnation and the exaltation of Jesus, ends with this. It says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a, on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. This is the message of missions. He is the subject and the substance of the gospel. We proclaim him, God in human flesh, exalted on high. We must exalt and proclaim Jesus. So let me ask you, are you doing that? Are you proclaiming Jesus? Are you proclaiming the gospel of our Lord? You know, I hear folks sometimes talk about how great it is that they were able to get a little God talk into their conversations. And of course, we need to talk about God. But sometimes it seems that Christians can feel really satisfied if they can just muster up enough courage to slip in a little statement like, God is good, or thank God. Thank God it didn't rain out the baseball game. 
And while it's great and we should acknowledge God's goodness and be ever thankful for all that he does, we do need to realize that most of our co-workers and our neighbors simply hearing the mention of God slipped into conversation, casual conversation, likely will not be caused to truly reflect upon the God who sovereignly, sovereignly created and sustains the world in which we live. It probably won't point them to truth any more than hearing themselves or others slip the word God into their speech followed by a cuss word coming out of their mouths in times of frustration. I live in a culture where you constantly hear phrases like Dios te bendiga, God bless you, meaning nothing more than have a great day. Or si Dios quiere, which means if God wills. But that phrase has become so much a part of the common culture that you will hear it roll off the tongue of people who would never acknowledge the Lord's actual sovereign control over all things through his acts of providence. I guess you could say it's kind of like ungodly politicians saying, God bless America. That kind of God talk seldom offends because so many use the words without any real acknowledgement of the one true living God. And that kind of so-called God talk will never really point your neighbor to Christ. We need to be willing to openly talk to others about Jesus, our Lord. Does talking to others about Jesus make you feel a little squeamish? You think, well, I'm not sure how my coworkers would react if I so boldly talked about Jesus as Lord, as sovereign. And what you mean to say is I'm pretty comfortable talking about God in a very general way that doesn't affect or offend anyone's sensibilities because I don't want people to think I'm some kind of Jesus freak. Or maybe you're just a little ashamed of Jesus. Return with me for a moment to Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those you talk to will either come to exalt the name of Jesus as fellow worshipers, worshipers of our King, or they will one day acknowledge Him as their rightful judge at the great white throne judgment when they hear the reading of their sentence of death before being thrown into the lake of fire. They need to know Jesus, not some vague notion of God, any God. They need to know Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know, if you're not sharing the gospel, it's possible that one reason for that may just be that you really haven't come to know and love Jesus in a very deep and meaningful way. And I'm not saying if you're not actively sharing the gospel, you probably aren't even saved. I mean, that obviously could be one reason. But what I'm saying is that as we develop an ever-deepening knowledge of Jesus, we, are not only want, we not only want to praise Him, but we want others to praise Him as well. He deserves that praise, and we want to multiply the praise and exaltation of Jesus our Lord. Just knowing that it is your responsibility or obligation, as Paul stated in verse 14 of chapter 1, may cause you to feel guilty concerning your disobedience to Christ. But for some, the idol of feeling comfortable will still be far too strong. But when you repent of your comfort, worship, and experience the grace-filled forgiveness of the Lord, that will motivate you to share Jesus. Being deeply in love with Jesus and having a relationship that continues to grow day by day because you spend time getting to know Him better and He is revealed here in His Word so you spend time in His Word walking with Jesus. 
that growing desire, that wanting Him to be worshipped by others, that just may be what you need to get past slipping a little God talk into your conversation and start telling others about Jesus. Talking about the gospel of God concerning His Son, the God-man, the mediator, reconciling man to his maker. This is the message of missions. Its subject is beyond description. Now, we, we've talked about His humanity, his deity. Let's take a little deeper dive and look just briefly at what our text indicates about his identity. While so infinite that we cannot fully describe him, we are given here in our text three, three words that will help us grasp a little more concerning the person who we are to proclaim. His identity, the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, Savior, the Lord who is salvation. Matthew 121, she shall bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Christ, Spirit anointed one, the long awaited promised Messiah, empowered by the anointing of the Holy Spirit from on high. Lord, sovereign. One who exercises supernatural authority over everything. This has been the confession of believers throughout the ages. Jesus is Lord. Our Lord reigns. And as we read in Philippians 2, one day all will recognize His Lordship, whether as their Savior or as their Judge, who declares their final sentence. Why so much time unpacking the identity of Jesus? Because the more you know Jesus, the more you will desire that others know Him too. The more you worship Jesus, the more you will want others to worship Jesus as Lord. So open your Bibles and spend time with Jesus. Paul desired to continually be deepening his knowledge of Jesus. He said in Philippians 3.8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus, of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He went on to say in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So do you truly know Jesus? Do you know him? Are you deepening your knowledge of him? So far, we've looked at the messenger in missions, and we've looked at the message of missions. Now let us consider the mission of missions. The mission of missions, verses 5 through 6. The gospel of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. There, there are five things here in this text that I want us to see concerning the mission of missions. You know, I said five, so they're thinking, okay, we've got to go pretty fast. The first thing is the provision for the mission, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. The mission of missions is all by grace. We are saved by grace, and we serve by grace. By God's grace, we are empowered to proclaim the message which can only be received by grace. Grace upon grace upon grace. And what a blessed privilege it is to have the opportunity to graciously given to us to proclaim the gospel. To be channels of God's grace given to us to proclaim the gospel to others so that they can experience God's grace. So the provision of the mission is God's grace. Our text says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Again, we understand here that Paul and the twelve are the only ones who by God's grace were called to the apostolic office and empowered with apostolic gifts. But in a more general sense of the word, we too are the ones who are sent. Sent as messengers to proclaim the message of Christ who is the subject and substance of the gospel. Jesus Christ, God who took on human flesh, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, paid for the sins of the chosen, rose from the grave, and ascended on high. Do you know the message? Are you serving as His messenger? 
Next, we see the pursuit of the mission to bring about the obedience of faith. The pursuit of the mission. In one sense, there is an invitation associated with the gospel. We are invited to come. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The gospel is offered freely, but there is also an expectation that you should respond. Yes, there is an aspect of invitation, yet in the presentation of the gospel, there is also, it is also much more than an invitation. The message of the gospel is presented in the imperative. We are told to come. There is a command concerning the message. It is the demand of the gospel. By grace, we are sent to bring about the obedience of faith. We pursue men and women, boys and girls, with the gospel. We are called to proclaim a compelling message. As you can read in Mark 1, 14 and 15, Jesus was proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, Repent and believe the gospel. And when the Lord says that we should do something, the required response is obedience by faith. Where there is no obedience, there is no faith. Faith involves an act of the will. Actively placing your faith in Jesus, trusting Him with your life, and submitting to His Lordship. There is a transfer of allegiance. There is a change of masters. No longer enslaved to sin and serving self, but now free to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 6 of Romans, in the flow of Paul's argument for the righteousness of God in saving unrighteous sinners because of what Christ has done, he speaks of this change of allegiance to a new master. Verse 16 of Romans 6, he says, Do you not know, as they say, can you not draw this obvious conclusion? Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves to sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. So the question must be, who is your master? Are you a slave to sin or of the master, of the Savior? Are you not really sure? Well, let me help you to discover the answer to that question with another question. Who do you obey? Are you someone who was once a slave to sin, but now have become an obedient, someone who is obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching found here in the Word of Christ? What is your response to Jesus? Do you obey His Word and submit to His will? Who is your master? Are you willing to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? So what is the specific pursuit of the mission of missions? To bring about the obedience of faith. Next, we see the purpose of the mission of missions. The purpose of the mission of missions. Above all else, why do we do what we do? Why do we go? Why do we proclaim? By God's grace, we as a local church send messengers to proclaim the message. The message, the gospel of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name. Let's just say it again. It's, it's all about Jesus. It's all about multiplying the exaltation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are His messengers. We preach His, His message. We proclaim Jesus for the supreme purpose of multiplying the praise of the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The, the sum of all that He is. His attributes. All that His name represents. By the authority of Jesus Christ, we are to be about the business of making disciples of all the nations, baptizing those that He saves, and teaching them to obey all that Christ has commanded. This is the ministry of reproduction. The reproduction of God-glorifying, believer-edifying, lost-evangelizing local churches for the sake of the name of Jesus our Lord. We exalt Christ and call others to join us in the exaltation of Christ. 
We, we go into the highways and byways gathering worshipers for our king. And where specifically do we go? Well, our text answers that question as well. So next we will see the place of the mission of missions. This answers the question concerning how far does the reach of the gospel of God extend? The gospel of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. The place of the mission in the ministry of missions is the entire world. We go forth to gather worshipers of Jesus from among all the nations of the earth. As Paul exclaimed a few verses later, verse 16, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Christ's kingdom shall be populated with people from every tribe and every tongue together exalting the name of Jesus. Our church family here one day worshiping together with our church family from Mexico, from Honduras, from Peru, also from Brazil, Mozambique, and beyond. So the place of the mission of missions is the entire world. And finally, we notice the promise. The promise of the mission of missions. We have been called and sent to proclaim the gospel of God concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations. And notice what Paul says next to those believers at Rome, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. As we go forth proclaiming the gospel to everyone in every place, knowing that all have sinned and that all deserve to spend an eternity in hell, experiencing the wrath of a holy God, we go forth with the confidence that He has scattered His elect among the nations throughout the world. We have this confidence that while all like sheep have gone astray, rebelling against their Creator, pressing headlong towards the hell that we all deserve. God in eternity past, in an act of His own sovereign will, chose some to be the recipients of His grace and mercy. He didn't have to save any, but He chose to save some. And Jesus went to the cross, dying in their place to accomplish the atonement for their sins. And all who were chosen by the Father and given to the Son to be His inheritance will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be brought to faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God has guaranteed the success of the mission. And God always keeps His word. This is the promise of the mission of missions. As did Jesus before us, we freely preach the gospel, calling upon all men to repent and believe, knowing with full confidence that there is also an effectual call of the gospel which will triumph in the hearts of those for which it was intended. And notice that the verse says, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, or among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd, John 10, 16. We sow the seed of the gospel everywhere, leaving the results to God, who will bring forth the fruit of the gospel in the lives of those he has sovereignly chosen to be the recipients of his gracious and merciful message. His gracious gracious and merciful love. We have this confidence. The promise of the mission is that God will accomplish what He has set out to do. Christ will get His bride, His inheritance, promised to Him by the Father. And Christ said, I will build My church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, 18. Christ will build His church. And He has chosen to do that through the proclamation of the gospel message. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. So we must proclaim the message of the gospel, because there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven among whom we must be saved. 
It is all about Jesus going forth, gathering worshipers of our Lord. So will you keep praying for the messengers of missions? Sacrificing so the message of missions can be proclaimed at home and around the globe? So that the mission of missions gets accomplished for the sake of the name of Jesus? I hope so. And if you've never come to the obedience of faith in Jesus, this message is for you. Don't don't wait. Jesus is calling you to repent and believe the gospel. Father, we thank you for this message from your word and the message of the gospel. We thank you for faithful messengers who are carrying your message and proclaiming your message. We thank you that you will be glorified in bringing all of your chosen to you and in establishing local churches as a part of your universal church so that in other places around the globe, those for whom you died will have the opportunity to hear the message and come to Christ and become worshipers of you. So we thank you, Lord, for this church. We thank you for this body of believers who has faithfully and continues to faithfully be involved in supporting the messengers of your message. And those who are involved in proclaiming your message, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to raise up from within this church family others who will proclaim faithfully your message to their friends and family and neighbors so that in this place others will be called to gather together and worship you. And we thank you for those who are being sent, those who are being prepared because you have called them. And we ask, Lord, that you would find us faithful as a church body to sacrificially and prayerfully continue to be involved in sending out your messengers and supporting your message so that you might be glorified, not only by those who gather together in this place, but by many brothers and sisters who have come into the family from throughout the nations of the earth. We ask this so that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing by faith together.
right, you can be seated just briefly.